Hey everyone. So I have a real quick announcement that I'm hoping you'll be excited about. The Suzanne Benker show will now drop three times per week. Yep. Three times. If you need your weekly Suzanne Benker show fix, you're now going to get it in spades. I'm mainly doing this because there are so many things I want to cover that I can't possibly cover in one show a week. And I don't always want to have a guest on because, um, because I don't. So, so you're going to hear a lot more from me basically. Um, and a little bit less of guests for the time being, although I will have guests on again in the future, no question. So I recommend subscribing to this show. So you get notifications with the topic of the day, each time a new episode is dropped. Also, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter so you can get free eBooks and an early release of each episode. You can do all of this at SuzanneBenker.com forward slash podcast. Again, that's SuzanneVenker.com forward slash podcast. And now on with the show. From the magnificent Midwest, it's the Suzanne Venker Show, where men and women are equal in value, but wildly different by nature. Join us here every week when we challenge the culture's hugely flawed narratives about men, women, sex, and love. From coast to coast and from around the world, thank you for joining us. In recent years, there's been an awful lot of moaning from an awful lot of unhappy Americans, accompanied by an awful lot of excuses as to why they're not responsible for their unhappiness, economic circumstances, or behavior. America has become a nation with far too many narcissistic, entitled, excuse-making moaners who simply refuse to own their problems and the solutions thereto. But it wasn't always this way. Here to talk with us about this massive phenomenon that has infected America for years is Dr. Brian Russell. Brian is a psychologist, attorney, and serial entrepreneur with global perspective and deep experience in behavioral healthcare operations, law, technology, and public policy. As a psychologist, Brian has practiced both clinically and forensically, treating adults and children, and serving as an expert in criminal and civil legal matters. As an attorney, he has represented clients in high and low profile criminal cases and has served as a mediator, litigation consultant, and advisor to lawmakers on issues involving mental health and crime. Brian has been a featured expert on multiple national television networks and is the author of the book, Stop Moaning, Start Owning, How Entitlement is Ruining America and How Personal Responsibility Can Fix It. Welcome to the show, Brian. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. I, I have so much to talk about. Um, so as I mentioned in the intro, you have such an interesting, varied background. So how did you get from lawyer to psychologist to this to that? Like, what was the... Um, what was the, yeah, what am I trying to say? What was the uh, trajectory there? That's what I wanted. Well, I knew that I wanted to be a lawyer and I decided to tack on an MBA because it was only an extra year. The school I went to had a combined program and about halfway through that, I decided I was more interested in why people did the bad things that landed them in court than I was in representing them in court. So I decided to stick around, get a PhD in clinical psychology and do expert work, which I did do, but I also started getting called almost immediately a lot by the media, wanting me to come on and talk about why people did the various bad things they were covering in the news. I'm completely fascinated by the why too, Brian. I mean, the why drives me every time. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing stuff. And um, there's no end to that question, right? For everybody. Yep. Yep. And that led to the book about entitlement because entitlement was the answer so many of the times. Yeah. And we're going to talk about that, obviously. So I love the book. Um, great, great stuff. I'm going to open by just, I'm going to read kind of a lengthy opening that just sort of, I think sums up what the reason was that you wrote this book and what it's about. And then we'll just go from there. Sound good? Yep. Oh, and also I have to say you're a fellow Midwesterner, which I want to say to everybody because they know how much I love the Midwest because I'm from the Midwest and I opened my program talking about the magnificent Midwest. So it's always awesome to have somebody who's from the Midwest. Got Thank you. That. I agree. Okay. Quote, you wrote, over my professional lifetime, I have seen personal responsibility drifting with increasing inertia toward an age of entitlement. You've seen it too. You've seen it in the skyrocketing rates of parental abandonment, divorce, and remarriage, 
and in the damage that does to the children involved, both while they're children and later when they attempt to form healthy, enduring relationships and families of their own. You've seen it in the pervasive excuse making by criminals who consciously choose to behave in heinously destructive ways and then when caught attribute their behavior to bad parenting, historical oppression, some compulsive behavioral disease like addiction to drugs or sex. You've seen it in the escalating unsustainable debt that Americans are carrying, both individually and collectively. You've seen it in the increasing numbers of claims for disability and other forms of public assistance when in fact the number of adult Americans who are mentally or physically incapable of sustaining themselves and their children are, thankfully, relatively small. You've seen it in the ever increasing acceptance of recreational drug use, of sexual promiscuity, of obesity as yet another disease, all of which are driven by hedonistic impulses over which people are no longer expected to exert much, if any, self-control. That's a lot. Oh my gosh. So, 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 so true. And I was so excited when I first found out about you in this book, because I, when I started writing for the first time, like 25 years ago, this was such a um, theme um, that was, that just became a part of my work, although I've never written about it in a book like this, like you have. So really, really loved it. So Oh my gosh. So let's go back to, you got into this because of what you were describing a moment ago, right? The things that you were seeing on a regular yes. basis, right? And yes. you piece this all together and this was like the common thread. Is that accurate? Yes. I think we all want to feel like, um, you know, in the course of our career, we leave behind, you know, something that sort of sums up uh, what we've learned. And I think you've probably done that with your books. And this was my attempt, or at least my first attempt uh, to do that. Yes. Okay. So there's a lot to unpack in here. Um, I pointed out three things that you wrote, or I wrote down th three things that you pointed out, I guess I should say, um, that I want to talk about. Um, you essentially said that law is now useless. Parents, I don't know if you used the word useless. I think you did. And public schools. So law, parents, and public schools have all sort of, let's just say, caved to this mentality. And so they're all corrupt with this same, I call this a disease, right? This lack of personal responsibility. Yeah. So let's go through that. You talked with law with respect to no-fault divorce. Right. Yeah, so law, you know, is really society's way of trying to regulate um, people's behavior. And particularly when it comes to the law, it's, you know, trying to prevent destructive behavior um, more than it is, you know, trying to promote, you know, productive behavior. And so when you think about that, you think about, well, society's got to impose consequences on behavior that's destructive. Well, you look at no fault divorce laws. And basically at, at this point uh, across the United States, if you were to skip out on a gym contract, the law would do more uh, to help the gym collect than it would if you skipped out on a marriage and, and cheated and went off with another person. Uh, you know, the law would just look at that and go, well, we don't, we don't judge. Uh, you know, yet, yes, you made a a profound set of commitments when you made your vows and yes you've broken them but we don't really care about that we're just going to divide everything 50 50 and send you both on your ways uh we wouldn't do that uh, if you skipped out on a gym contract we would make you pay the rest of the payments or or something pay pay some amount to the gym uh so it really is you know kind of a, a nice example although it's a sad example of how i think society in many ways has sort of abdicated you know that traditional function of the law in trying to, you know, prevent destructive behavior. Yeah. And of course, prior to, prior to that subject of the law is, is schools, right? Because schools from K through K through 12, and then certainly on, on college campuses, we know that, but yeah. really it's now all the way from the beginning. And I think that's gotten considerably worse over the last 10 years. It's, Great. it's such a mess. It, it's such a mess. And I have such a, I feel so much for it because we got to, we send our kids to private school. And so I, it's so easy when you go the private school route um, to forget about how the vast majority of people are having to deal with this because we, we, we didn't in many ways. So my heart goes out to people who can't afford the private school and are stuck with either that or homeschooling. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm a product of private school as well. And I'm so thankful for the sacrifices that my parents made to make that happen because they were not, um, it, it wasn't easy. Uh, they had yeah. four kids, um, yeah. all of whom they they did that for. But it's because they understood um, how important it was. Uh, I, I think with uh, <clears throat> you know, certainly there are some wonderful public school teachers out there. But I think with the private school, you, you have a higher likelihood 
of there being, you know, sort of a greater commonality of purpose among the parents. Uh, you know, th they're all making sacrifices to some degree because they have uh, ideas about what education mm -hmm. is supposed to do. And usually it's supposed to have not just an academic component, but a values component. And I think that the parents then, because they're paying and nobody has to be there, they do get a little bit louder voice. They get listened to a little bit better by the administration uh, when they have concerns. And I think there's more of a concern a lot of times in the private school about you know, wanting there to be a certain kind of a culture there. Um, and if somebody is there who's, uh, you know, a, a net, net uh, detriment to that, um, then they don't have to be kept around like they do yeah. uh, in the public school. So, so for all of those reasons, I'm just a proponent of the private schools for folks who can swing it. And, um, you know, I guess I hope that if there's anything uh, good to come out of what we've seen here in the last year or so with COVID and schools being shut down. And then when they're open, the kids having to wear the masks, even though, uh, even in situations where, you know, it doesn't seem like the kids were really at great risk. I I'm hoping that this maybe causes more parents uh, to take a second look at private options. Definitely. And I want to throw out, because I think this is so important for people who aren't as familiar with private options. I live in St. Louis and we are just inundated with private schools. It's one of the best places to raise a family, in my opinion, because of its number, the number of options for schools. And I want to point out that you can send your kids to Catholic schools for a very reasonable amount. So when we're talking about private schools, we're not necessarily talking about $20,000 a year schools. It doesn't jump until high school. So really from K through eight, if you wanted to get that grounding in there, and I'm a product of Catholic schools without having been Catholic. So that's why I always want to point that out to people that I really feel like, I kind of feel like they're going to do better and better, those schools, because of what's happening in this country and not worry about the Catholic piece. If you're not Catholic, just just go there for the tradition and the tradition um, education that is. Yep, I agree. Yeah. So just want to throw that out there. Um, Okay, and then of course the big one, Brian, parents. Um, gosh, this is such a big subject and I think so few people are willing to really go there as far as how bad parenting has become and how much it's changed in the last 30 years because their friends, their family, you know, they're gonna step on someone's toes, they're gonna make someone feel bad. Parenting is a very personal course there's not one good way to parent. Everybody has to do it that one way. That's certainly not the case. It's just, you point out in the book that parents today, unlike 30, 40, 50 years ago, are either not around or very self-absorbed. And the reality is, look, look at social media. I, we, we, my husband and I are about to be empty nesters and we didn't have phones in the first 12 years of their lives. I look at this, these families having to contend with this now or choosing to really. Um, because when we started it, we didn't know what you know now, you know, right. uh, for like smoking, I guess. Um, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, so much to say about how to parent in a world where phones are in your five-year-old's hand. I don't even know where to begin with that. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I agree. And it's, uh, it really is frightening when you think about, you know, the power that that device puts into the hands of an immature child to access, yes, you know, positive information and things like that and, and social connections and all that with peers, but also you know, profoundly dangerous uh, content out there. And to be, to be you know, uh, to, to be targeted, to, to be, you know, to be identified and targeted and tracked and, and so forth and so on. So, um, yeah, I'm with you. I think that uh, you know, it is not uh, the case that parents have to just sort of throw up their hands and go, well, you know, we're living in the age of, you know, yeah. everybody has to have a smart device in their hand all the time. I understand people saying, well, I want to be able to contact my kid. I want my kid to be able to contact me. I want my kid to be able to call 911 and so forth and so on. But, but there are ways to accomplish that mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. putting, you know, the, the power of the entire World yeah. Wide Web um, in your kid's hand 24 hours a day uh, when you're not present to oversee it. Well, and that second part is so important because at the very least, if you're going to give your kid a phone earlier than say you or I might, you can't disappear. You can't hand him the phone and then right. go to work full time right. and not be there. Right, right. Yeah. Oh. And there's all kinds of technologies. I think parents don't, some of them don't know this, I guess, but there are all kinds of technologies out there for limiting the content of what kids can see. Now, now the, the downside of those are that the kids are usually smarter than the parents about how to circumvent those kinds of technologies. But you know, if you're a smart uh, parent early on, and you're interested in 
you know, regulating and, and limiting the content that the kids can access via the phone. You can accomplish that to a significant degree. You can work with your carrier. Uh, you, you, could, you can, you know, do your own research and, and look at the various apps online. Um, but I always, if you're going to put a phone in your kid's hands, I think um, knowing what, uh, you know, data is traveling uh, across across that bandwidth is, uh, it's a responsibility. It's a personal responsibility of yours. Yeah, and so speaking of, uh, just to um, reiterate the point, that's really what this book is about. It's about not abdicating personal responsibility. You wrote, quote, Americans are accepting neither accountability, personal re personal responsibility for behaving badly in the past, nor are they accepting, and I love this word because you never hear it anymore, the obligation or the personal responsibility to behave well in the present and future. We might hear the word, the phrase personal responsibility, but we rarely, if ever, hear the word obligation. And it's such an important yeah. word. Yeah, and you know, I, I write, uh, there's a whole uh, section in there in the book about happiness. And I really uh, am frightened by the, the frequency, and you've probably heard this too, with which I hear a parent say, well, in, in order for me to do my best parenting, I need to be happy. You know, I need to be happy in order to be a, an effective parent, or I need to be happy in order for them to be happy. And and those things, you know, I, I understand everybody wants to be happy. I, I want people to be happy too, but that just isn't true. No, it's absolutely not true. Your, your kid doesn't really care if you're happy or not. They just want you there. Yeah, that's right. And, and I'm not really sure how your kid should, you know. You know Measure. I've, like I've, I've, I've said to many parents, how, how does your kid know? <laughs> like, if, if you're unhappy in your marriage, for example, um, you know, your kid doesn't necessarily have to know that, um, right. you know, right. I, I'm not, if, if right. you're, if you're unhappy in your marriage and your eight-year-old knows it, um, you know, it, it, then I, I really, I want to hear more about that. I mean, th there are certain times when, you know, yes, I can understand if, if there's, there's violence, yeah. if there's, there's violence going on, then of course, and, and you can't stay in that situation or keep a kid in it, of course. Um, you know, uh, I talked to a, a parent uh, the other day whose uh, teenager, um, you know, b became aware that the other parent was cheating. You know, okay, well, well now, you know, that, that's the cat's out of the bag there, obviously, that there's profound trouble uh, in the marriage in the household. And, and, and I understand that parent's concern about, well, you know, what, what message am I sending if I put up with this? I get all that. But, but I think a lot of times when people go, well, you know, I, I can't you know, I have to be happy or else my kid's going to know and it's going to be detrimental. I think it's not, that, that's not a given. No. And there's a flip side to that too. You can use that as a learning opportunity to figure out yourself why that happened, how we're going to fix it. And then you pass on to your children. You have them, you sit down and you tell them why it happened and you stay together and you, you know, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's like, it's about measuring. Let's see, am I going to go this path or this path and which one's going to have the most damage? It's just so obvious, right? Um, unless you're dealing with something obviously horrible, horrible. Um, yeah. yeah, well, I'm glad you brought up happiness because that's where I was going to go next. We talk, or you talk in the book about happiness in the past versus now, where mm -hmm. it was much more um, others focused in the past and very mm -hmm. self focused today. And then I added sort of this concept of getting something versus doing something. So if I get married, what am I going to get out of it? What is he yes. going to give to me as opposed to yes. what am I going to give? Yes. Yeah, and, and that really is, I think, you know, you've probably seen this too, and you're, you know, working with, um, working with couples over the years, and, and I certainly have that, you know, it's very important that when they're walking down the aisle, one of their sort of profound reasons for being there is wanting the other person's good, wanting, wanting you know, seeing part of, a big part of your mission in life as helping that other person to, you know, have, have the best possible life they can become the, everything that they can, can and want to be and so forth and so on. Uh, you know, and, and I really think, um, you know, to, to take it one step further, I, I think we don't, we don't just have people um, in relationships today, you know, making the decision to be in them or not based on, you know, well, is it a net gain for me? Am I, am I, you know, what have you done for me lately? And today, have I gotten more from you than I've put in? Um, I think it goes even, it's even worse than that. In, in some respects, we have people that are sort of judging, you know, what's right and what's wrong based on how happy it makes me, how good it makes me feel in the moment. And, and, and that is truly frightening because as we all know, um, 
you know, who, who really think critically about this stuff, as I know you do and I do too, that the right thing doesn't always feel great yes. in yeah. the moment, you know, and that's, that's because, um, you know, I think that, as I say in the book, people who chase happiness as a feeling um, are, are just kind of doomed to, to, to never really catch it in a sustained way that they might catch it in fleeting ways. But, you know, this is why you see, you know, celebrities uh, who seem to, to have it all, you know, they've got lots of money and lots of people are after them, want, want to be with them and so forth and so on. And then sometimes they're still suicidal because they've chased that happiness in, in a bottle. They've chased it in a pill. They've chased it in other, you know, sex with other people. They've, they've chased it in possessions. Um, and, and, and then it's still, they've still come up short. And so they just end up sort of despondent when, when the real truth is, I, I believe that happiness is a true happiness, sustained happiness is not an end state in itself. It's a byproduct of meaning. So you, you ought to be chasing after meaning in your life, which is not always fun in the moment. But when you do things that are meaningful and you look at your life and see that it has meaning, then I think sustained true happiness comes as a byproduct of that. So, so, so if you chase happiness as a feeling, I think you're, you're going after the wrong thing. If you chase meaning, you get happy as a byproduct and you're much more likely to really feel it uh, and, and have it be sustained in, in, a, in a really profound way. Yeah, and you, um, you, you. There's something else I have written down here that you wrote uh, that you wrote that um, speaks to that that I felt so deeply because I feel exactly the same way, and I think it's so rare. You said, "quote When I speak to corporate and college student audiences, I often say most psychologists try to make you feel better and worry less. I may actually make you feel worse." <laughs> Oh my gosh, can I uh, relate to this and worry more today, but it's only because I want to help you get better at identifying and avoiding destructive attitudes and behaviors in yourself and others. A little anxiety can help us to think ahead and plan better for our futures and be mindful and careful, end quote. So it's all about, yeah, I'm not going to be your best friend today, but what I'm going to tell you is actually going to work. I'm not interested right. in telling you what you want to hear so that you feel good because that doesn't right. solve anything. That's right. And so much of so much of clinical psychology, I think, in the last uh, you know, well, decades really, it has been aimed at, you know, getting rid of negative feelings. We're, we we want to get rid of um, sadness, we want to get rid of guilt, we want to get rid of shame, uh, we want to get rid of worry. Um, and, and you know, I can understand that. Those are uncomfortable. Um, feelings. However, um, you know, there's a reason why, you know, the human brain is, is wired uh, to feel those feelings because uh, they serve important purposes, right? You know, you feel guilt uh, when you need to think about your behavior and, and maybe, maybe uh, alter course or even maybe fix, uh, you know, fix damage that you've created. You feel shame when you've uh, acted, in, you know, when, when you should, some people feel shame when they shouldn't. And obviously that's a, that's a problem that is worth uh, clinical attention. But, but if people feel deserved shame, that is, you know, one of the primary ways that you know that you need to take a look at your life and your behavior and maybe alter course again, when, when you feel um, sad, you know, that, that is something that none of us wants to spend lots of time feeling in life. But uh, you know, for example, when we lose somebody important in our lives, um, you know, and we feel sad about it, in, in a way, you know, whenever I talk to people who are grieving, I say, you know, in a way, you know, imagine if this person left your life and, and you didn't mind. I mean, you know, it would mean that there wasn't really much, uh, you know, to that relationship. And, and so the sadness that you're feeling is a reflection of what an important relationship that was and what a big loss it is. And so, you know, after you feel that for a while, then of course, as clinicians, we want to try to help them to see that the things that they got from that relationship, um, bits and pieces and glimpses and glimmers of those things, they still get from other people. And not only that, but they are those things for some people in life. And, and that that's the way to carry that person who's gone now forward in a healthy way, as opposed to just trying to say, well, I'm, I'm never going to get over it. I'm going to stay stagnant right here. And that'll keep them around because that doesn't work. Um, so, so it's not that we want to, you know, have people feeling bad and anxious and shameful and guilty and sad, but but those emotions all have their purposes. And, and to just act like every time somebody feels them, it's pathology is just really 
really, uh, you know, overly simplistic and really pretty misguided, I think. Yeah, and totally destructive. It's just going to, yeah. it's going to keep you there. It, it, this is, that's the point of your book. Then you go into victim mode. As soon as you've labeled right. it, you're a victim and then there's yeah. no climbing out and that's not going to help you. Right. We're, we're, you know, you mentioned earlier about, I mean, the, the guilt and the shame and the trying to get rid of it. We're so good at numbing ourselves, right? And encouraging numbing ourselves. And that numbing doesn't have to just necessarily be drugs and alcohol or food or the more obvious things, but it can also be things like social media or yes. working too much or yes. you know, things that we don't typically think of, but you can throw yourself into those things. And I think I deal a lot with the latter one, but for women especially, who are throwing themselves into work, 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 and not really wanting to live the life they're living or face yes. what they're lacking. And, and, and that was drilled into them from the day they were born. And they think they're supposed to do that. And really, they're just running on empty. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I, I, feel, um, I feel sorry for the extent to which, um, you know, I, I think I, I'm, I'm, I am as every sane person, I think, um, in, in the world is, um, you know, a big believer in, you know, equality in terms of, in, you know, earnings and all that um, and, and opportunities and everything for the sexes. But I, I um, worry when it gets taken a step beyond that to where, you know, um, you know, opening a door for somebody uh, might be taken as insulting, you know, indicative of the fact that you think I can't open it myself or something like that. Because I, I think when we, when we took it to that nth degree, um, we really did sort of um, say, particularly to young men, that, you know, you no longer really need to, um, you don't really need to um, think of yourself as needing to um, be capable of, you know, providing for, like, for example, all of the needs of a family. Um, I, I grew up, my mom was a stay-at-home mom of four kids, and her job, I believe, was every bit as hard as any other mom's job, whatever else they were doing outside the home. Um, but, you know, I grew up seeing that and, and it really, it really, you know, instilled in me the belief that, you know, when I get older and I, you know, get married, I want to, um, I, I want to be able to give that choice to my wife. Right. I, you know, I want to be able to say, if you'd like to just stay home, that, that's, that I don't, there's no more important job. Um, right. You know, and so um, I feel like, you know, that uh, has gone a bit by the wayside, which is why we have so many, uh, you know, 30 year old guys, um, you know, living with mom and dad, uh, you know, barista at Starbucks uh, with, with a college degree. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with, you know, Starbucks, but, you know, but barista or something that doesn't have lots of uh, upward mobility potential in it. Uh, and then playing video games the rest of the time and, and, and not, not even, not, not even really thinking much in terms of, uh, you know, any kind of plan for any kind of profound, uh, you know, meaningful uh, uh, relationships and future and stuff. And if they do, then, then it, the, the thought is sort of, um, you know, well, what's she going to bring into it? What, what's, what, you know, and, and, and if, and if it turns out that, you know, she's, she's, uh, you know, m making more than them, uh, they're like, great. Yeah, right. Maybe, like, I, maybe, maybe I can stay home, which there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I, I don't think it has to be the mom that stays home if, if one parent decides to stay home. But, but I just feel like, um, I guess, I, I think it was Dr. Laura who said, uh, chivalry's dead and, and, uh, you know, feminism killed it. And, and, and again, she meant, she didn't mean, you know, the equal pay for equal work kind of feminism. She meant the, uh, you know, don't open the door for me. That's an insult. kind. That's right. And both men and women, of course, have gotten this message, which I, I talk about a lot. We focus so much on women having been given this message, but you basically just outlined what the effect was of telling men the same thing that um, they don't need to be chivalrous and they don't need to be providers when that is totally naturally in them and they want to be and we've snuffed it out of them and we did the same thing with women we pretended they were just like men and they want to be providers their whole lives they never want to step out they love this role they're going to think it's great <laughs> of course that goes against yeah. their natural so we're snuffing out nature yeah. in each sex yeah. under the guise really they're so. the same yeah I, I really think so and of course, the result is, is mayhem. I mean, dating is a nightmare. Marriages cannot thrive with that going on. And that's, that's where we are. Um, 
Okay, a couple of the things that you that, that are kind of big subjects, but I well not big subjects, but they're just complicated, I guess. Is you you talked in there the difference between and I'm paraphrasing here, and this is another something that I feel really strongly about and have written about in the past, and that is the difference between making value judgments versus being judgmental. There's such a massive difference, <laughs> but we've um, conflated them to say that you're not supposed to have any opinion about anything at any time because of yes. hurt feelings and whatnot. And the result, of course, is that there's no longer any value judgments made. So anything goes. Right. Well, and, and that is in, in total furtherance, right, of the, of the hedonistic kind of culture that we're living in, because, yeah. you know, part of the part of the um, <clears throat> part of the way to facilitate that is to take away uh, anybody's fear that they're going to be shamed uh, by their behavior. Right. And so if you look back, um, I, I don't remember uh, which you know founding founding uh, the father it was George Washington maybe uh, who said you know we'll, we'll never have enough cops and enough military and so forth and so on to, to have the government be the reason that most people behave you know productively most of the time uh, and if we did we wouldn't want to live in that society right that, that most of the time uh, what what makes most people do most things uh, you know right is the, the concern that they have about you know the social consequences yeah. of not and so yeah. when you take that away uh, you really do get uh, you really do run the risk of, of chaos and I think that we're there um, in many respects and and I think that it's we're so <laughs> it's so dangerous because um, it actually, you know, this is one of those areas where that, um, that effort or that, that, um, you know, phenomenon can actually suck in even some people who would sort of traditionally be on the other side. And I, I'm thinking about some religious people who say, well, you know, judge not lest you be judged or whatever. I, I'm, I'm told I'm not supposed to judge. Oh, and, and I, and I, I understand that, but, but I think that when people say that they're conflating a couple of things that are really important to separate out. And those would be, you know, judging the person's, you know, um, soul, the judging the person's, um, you know, salvation worthiness or whatever, um, versus judging the behavior. Right. I, I don't, I don't think it's up to any of us to judge, you know, what, what, you know, somebody's eternal no. fate should be. That's, that's God's to do. But, but I do think that, we are making a big mistake if we think that that means we can't sit there and go, that's destructive behavior that I'm seeing in front of my face. That person shouldn't be behaving that way. Um, that's a different story. And we okay. have to do that. We have, have to, to do that. that. But Brian, we don't. And you know who doesn't the most, in my opinion? Parents. Parents yeah. don't say anything. They stand by. And who else? Who, who's left to do that but parents? while the children are being raised and that's the time to do it and you used to be able to do it with other people's children when i had um little ones and i of course i had good friends and we shared hanging out with our each other's kids and you know if they left me with them or vice versa there was free reign to discipline them the way that we would if they were the parent but that's yeah. gone that just is not oh exist. yeah yeah well you know i i think i <clears throat> i'm trying to remember who it was, I think it might have been Gwyneth Paltrow, but I, I shouldn't say that because it might, I might be wrong and I don't want to, you know, bes besmirch her if I'm wrong, but, but I think it was her who said, you know, I, I try to raise my kids, I'm trying to raise my kids without ever saying no. Oh. And, I, and I'm sitting here going, wow, that's pretty amusing, I feel, because, you know, set, you know, helping the kid to set boundaries, you know, the, as I talk about in the book, it's like, you know, you, you bring a kid into the world and that kid has absolutely zero power to, um, you know, really do anything for itself. Um, and so, you know, 100% of the, of the power to make all the decisions for that kid and 100% of the responsibility for the outcomes of all those decisions, you know, is, is on the parent. Mm -hmm. But over the next 18 years, it, it's got to shift. Both things have to shift because that kid at 18 is going to be you know, a legal adult who has 100% of the power to make all of his or her own decisions, and, and then 100% of the responsibility uh, for the consequences of those choices. And so, you know, part of the way that you help as a parent over the 18 years to, to facilitate the shift is, you know, you do say no, you say no a lot, uh, because that's how you teach the person to, you know, set boundaries on, on behavior. And, and your hope is that, you know, at some point, 
you don't need to do it as much because the kid is doing it for themselves. Um, but but to, to go, well, there's never such a thing as something that's a no, is, oh. to, to me, that's abusive. I was just going to say, I shouldn't have laughed earlier because that's not funny. That is a serious, you are literally harming them for life if they have never understood or utilized that word. And if they can't say it for themselves or receive it, I mean seriously destructive for their own behaviors and their future relationships. Well, that's such a good point that you just made because because what you're teaching them then is, you know, if if I'm your parent and I, and I am, you know, imparting to you the philosophy that uh, no isn't okay, that, then I'm, I'm imparting to you that philosophy. So, so it's not okay for you to say it. So I guess you have to, you know, let people do whatever they want to do to you um, because you know, there's no, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, which is a very dangerous thing. I, I tried to, when I wrote my first book, it was about pretty much the needs of children. And it was like, the, I don't know that I talked specifically about no, but the importance of they're crying out for you to make those boundaries for them because they don't have them. I mean, it's sort of like how you and I might feel, think, of, think about that feeling when you go into the um, store to buy jeans, let's say, and holy crap, I mean, the array of options before you, it's just completely overwhelming, right? Or, and it doesn't have to be jeans, whatever. And you're like, God, can I just find the, 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 I want it to be the way it used to be where there was just three choices. That feeling of like, you're stuck and I need someone to help me and make the decision for me. That's how babies, toddlers, young children feel. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I think- Without the choice, some, just the, the, some, the world around them being so difficult. Summed up best by the, the teenager uh, that I talked to the other day, who's now a, an older teenager out of the parent's house, 19 years old. Um, who said to me, you know, they didn't, my, she was talking about her parents, uh, you know, they, my, my house was the house that people wanted to come to because it was, you know, they were my friends and, and not my parents. And my house was the house where anything went. And, you know, m maybe their philosophy was, you know, well, it's better to ha have everybody here uh, than, than some other place or whatever it was. But she said, you know, it, it's really sort of, dawned on me now in my early adulthood that they really didn't give much of a damn about me because they weren't, they weren't really, they couldn't really be bothered mm -hmm. to really look to see, you know, what kind of guardrails and boundaries and, and, and so forth would have been, you know, good for me to, to and that would have given me security. And she, and she looks back now and goes, you know, I, I didn't have a lot of security because, you know, the, the, when you're growing up, you, those, those boundaries, the guardrails, let you know somebody cares about you and that you can't go too far out of the bounds without somebody being there to, you know, to, to rein you back in. Um, and when there isn't that, even though, you know, every teenager would go, oh my God, that's what I want. Um, it, it really isn't. And, and then when you're an adult, you can look back and see that, which, which was a sad thing for me to hear this young woman say. Yeah. And to know that 30, 40, 50 years ago, parents knew that that just that that wasn't good for them, even though they, or that that's not even what they need, even though that may seem that way. Like we have an 18 year old son and we have to actively sort of, we have an older daughter who's gone. So we're just left with him and he's leaving in a month and we'll be empty nesters, but we have to sort of in, bring him into our space because he might balk, right? Cause he's, he's busy and he's almost, he's just basically an adult. Um, but he really does want to hang with us. He just kind of fakes it and pretends like he doesn't, but <laughs> you kind of have to know that, you know, um, yeah. and force, force it along and not take them at their word and let them guide you, you know, right. no. So it's very frustrating for me. Here's another big thing that you talked about, but it's a big, um, a word that I cannot stand today. And it's so common, this idea of feeling that the world owes you, right. Or that you're whatever you're owed in some way and then that translates to you deserve it yeah you deserve yeah. I hate the word deserve yes when it doesn't I do apply <laughs> i do too because it's so overused and so, so really bastardized today absolutely you, know, if you think about you know what you're entitled to in our society you know you're, you're entitled not to be abused you're entitled not to be you know, vi victimized in a you know in the sense of somebody committing a crime against you, um, you're entitled to your property, um, not to have your, your property stolen from you and, and so forth. But, you know, beyond, you know, those basics, um, you're really not entitled to much. Um, and, and it certainly seems like, at least over my lifetime, 
the list of things that, you know, if you just stop people in the, in the grocery store and said, you know, what are some things you're entitled to? It just seems to be just ever growing. And, and it's really, you know, you wonder, well, how does that, how does that work <laughs> over time? You know, <laughs> we're, we're all entitled to all this stuff. You know, somebody has got to be making all that happen. Um, you know, so, so it, it's, it's, it's a little frightening. It is frightening. It's a mindset that I just cannot get my head around. And I think it's still very new, very new. And I mean, in our generation, you weren't raised that way at all. That would be comical to think that you deserve something or that you're owed something. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So I haven't asked you about this program, Fatal Vows. <laughs> so I thought I would do that. Um, yeah. I've never seen it, but it's, um, it's criminal psychology behind deadly divorces, right? Yes. So what was your role in that um, series and what did you learn with respect to the subject that we're talking about today? Well, so, um, so Fatal Vows was on from uh, 2012 uh, to 2020. We had seven seasons in there. Um, wow. And uh, yeah, it was really it's just sort a, of a, a great dateline. I love Dateline. Was it like that? Um, <laughs> A little bit, uh, but but ours had, um, yeah, yeah, a little bit. Our, ours had it was a, it was a combination of my co-host and I giving you the expert analysis of what was happening, and then there was some narration of of what had gone on, and then there were some reenactments of what had gone on, and then there were some interviews with people who were actually involved in some way, so family members, law enforcement, etc. And so every episode was based on a real case. Uh, in which one spouse had ended up murdering the other. And um, I, th I think there might have been one episode in the whole seven seasons where somebody ended up, nobody ended up dead at the end, where somebody ended up surviving the attempt. But so. Wait, say every season was one couple or more than one couple? No, every episode was, was a different story. Um, it's, it's frightening to think about the fact that there are about three of those every day in the United States of America, spousal murders. Um, and so. We had uh, sadly a lot of subject matter to work with, and so you know you could look at that and say, well, you know this is just uh, you know th that kind of entertainment that is just sort of train wreck entertainment for people to to uh, you know watch and you know do downward social comparison or whatever. But I I always I didn't think that, and maybe I was maybe I was you know wishfully thinking, but I think that you know when you look at really profound. Uh, crashes and burns like what we spotlighted, um, there actually are a lot of lessons in it for, you know, the average couple who is not going to end up in a murder situation, but, you know, might end up uh, just in a really unhappy marriage for a long time, might end up uh, in, in a, you know, very difficult divorce and custody situation. Um, and so, you know, it was really gratifying over those years to you know, get the messages from time to time where somebody said, you know, I think you guys saved me. I, I saw your show. I was in a relationship like that. I got out or my sister was and I helped her get out because I, you know, pointed mm -hmm. out that I had seen the show. So, you know, lessons we learned were, you know, there were basically um, the top three reasons that landed people on our show were um, infidelity, number one. Um, number two was financial uh strife, financial problems. And, and I would say, you know, particularly financial cheating in the sense of, you know, people lying to their spouse about, you know, the bills are paid and so forth and so on. And really it's going to the casino or going to the, some other place. The, the, the third thing is, you know, trying to do this blended family stuff where they think they're going to be the Brady Bunch and they don't realize that successfully step parenting minors is one of the most difficult roles that I think a human being can ever Amen. play because Amen. you're you're sort of a parent, uh, you're a quasi parent, you're kind of a parent. It's your house too, and so you should feel like you have some ability to dictate what goes on in there. And yet, you know, you're really not. A, you're constantly subject to the you're not my mom, you're not my dad, which is true. Uh -huh. um, and and I, you know, you know, to be honest, I, I. I you know, would like to say that lots and lots of times in my career, I've seen, you know, the introduction of a step parent into a minor's life be a, a big net positive for the kid. But I can't honestly say that. Uh, I think a lot of times, you know, the, the minors are resentful that, you know, they've already had the mom and dad split. They're already, you know, vying for, you know, you know, the, the half of the parent, other parents' attention who's not under the same roof with them right now. Um, and, and so to have to share that with somebody, have that be further divided and everything. 
Um, you know, I think it's, you know, it's more often the case than not that the kids are resentful and I understand it. Um, you know, th thank God, you know, it didn't happen to me because I, I think I wouldn't have liked it and I understand why the kids uh, don't. And I think it's why, you know, um, the, the divorce rate for marriages where somebody brings in a minor child or both of them do is, you know, 70 percent plus. Um, it's just very, very hard. And, and so those those were, you know, that, that maybe is the biggest lesson of fatal vows, that those three things, cheating, uh, you know, physically, uh, cheating financially, and, you know, trying to, uh, you know, underestimating the difficulty of blending families were, were the three big reasons why people ended up on our show, sadly. You know, Brian, I would love to have you back at some point and do a whole episode on that whole concept of trying to successfully step parent. That would be really great if you would do sure. that because absolutely that requires that definitely requires an episode i think there's a lot of people who and I, you're not going to get that you're not going to hear that anywhere I, I nobody talks about that because for the obvious reason you know um okay so let's get to the cure the cure brian <laughs> we know the cure is personal responsibility right um but you had three things i wrote down here um that were a little more specific than that so you talked um at first about gratefulness and the percentage yeah. of people who see the glass half empty versus full. Talk about that. Yeah. <clears throat> so I think that one of the most, the, the, the two really powerful antidotes to entitlement are personal responsibility and gratitude. And, and I think when you're going through life <clears throat> and you raise your children to go through life um, cognizant all the time or, or you know, cognizant on a daily basis of all of the things that you actually do have to which you're not entitled, you, but, you, but you're fortunate to have them anyway. Uh, nobody owed them to you, but you have them, either because you, you know, worked hard and you got them, or somebody, um, somebody you know, loved you enough to give those things to you, uh, whatever it is, um, you know, and, and you know, your health. Uh, you know, so, so you know, maybe it's God that loved you enough to give it to you, but, but those things that you have that you're not entitled to that are good. I think when you're going through life cognizant of those, it's really hard to, to be, you know, sort of sucked into that entitlement mentality. And, and then the personal responsibility would be the other one, the other big antidote. Okay, and then two more. Uh, second mm -hmm. one is teaching traditions. You wrote about that. Here, here, obviously I'm all for that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you know, I, I think, um, I believe, you know, and I, I was a, a kid who was fascinated by history and done a lot of travel to look around the world at other places and how they are set up and kind of what the guiding philosophies are in those places versus here. And, and I really believe, um, you know, it's, there's something very dangerous happening in, in our society today where, you know, people who don't agree with <laughs> the, the guiding principles being personal liberty and personal responsibility. Because I think that those were the guiding principles on which we were found. Doesn't mean we got it right 100% of the time, fully at the beginning, certainly not. But, but the, those guiding principles, I think, are what we have always aspired to, at least as a people, as an American people. And I think that with the dangerous, dangerous thing that I see happening in society is people saying uh, to kids, well, an idea is only as good as whoever articulated it. So if you can find something wrong with the person who articulated it, then the idea stinks. And, and, and that just isn't true. You know, the idea of personal liberty and personal responsibility being the combo upon which a society should be built, um, I think is correct regardless of whether uh, everybody who articulated yeah. that or anybody who articulated it always got it right, but, you know, even if they got it profoundly wrong. Um, well, that, at the beginning. that sort of reminds me of when somebody says something, this is one of my favorites, they'll say something that's pro-marriage, but they've had a divorce in their past. So you're not supposed to listen to that person because he or she's divorced. But yeah. actually they learn from that and that's why they're telling you that. So pay attention to what they're saying. It doesn't make what they're saying any less true just because they Correct. failed. Correct. Right. And hypocrisy is, you know, do what I say and not as I'm doing. Right. Hypocrisy is not, you know, do what I say and not as I did. did. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and that's an important distinction, I think, to be made. So, so, so that's what I mean about the, the tradition. I think it's important for kids to learn that, you know, this was a unique 
experiment in all of human history to go, we're going to try to build a society on the principles of personal liberty and personal responsibility, where we're going to try to give people the personal liberty to pick and choose what they want to do, what they want to study, what they want to be um, in life, um, and also then give those people the, the maximum possible degree of personal responsibility for the outcomes of whatever choices they make. So if they make bad, destructive choices, they're going to bear the blame. If they make good, really successful, productive choices, they're going to get to, to, to reap most of those rewards, or all of them, or most of them, right? And so, so I, I think that that is it's a dangerous thing that that is not being, uh, you know, imparted, I think, to kids uh, b because the theory is, well, you know, if the imperfect people came up with that, then, then the, the right. theory is right. imperfect. And, right. and that just isn't true, in my opinion. Agreed. Okay. And then the last one is pop the poverty perspective. You wrote about that. What is that? <clears throat> well, I, I think you're talking about just the fact that if, if you look at, um, if you look at the ways that people end up in poverty in the United States of America, um, and it, certainly there are exceptions to this, there, there are people who are in poverty because they've got physical and mental limitations that make it hard for them to, um, to, to you know, sustain themselves, uh, certainly. But if you take them uh, and, and kids who are not you know, mature enough to do it yet uh, aside for a second, and you just look at able-bodied, able-minded adults, you know, um, it, it's really hard to find, uh, you know, high numbers of folks that are in poverty in the United States of America for sustained periods of time. You know, there, there could always be somebody who's in between jobs for a little while or whatever and, and is struggling to make ends meet. But for long periods of their lives, um, it, it's hard to find a lot of them who have not, um, you know, done certain things. So if, if you if you don't want to be in poverty in the United States of America and you don't commit any crimes you don't get addicted to anything. You don't drop out of uh, school before you, at least you get a high school diploma and you don't make any children uh, out of wedlock. Yep. You know, your chances of ending up in poverty for any sustained period of time, and again, if you're an able-bodied, able-minded person are very, very low. And, and if you wanna make them even lower, you know, if you go out there and you take stock of your uh, unique skills and talents and gifts and abilities uh, and you, figure out a way, you know, to make your, your best, uh, you know, highest, most unique, uh, good contribution to something larger than yourself, uh, you know, you, you will have a, a, almost an infinitesimally low chance yeah. of, of being um, in poverty for a real long time. Right. Yep. <clears throat> Of course, that goes against um, what what the cultural narrative is, which is that you're right. with your circumstances, and there's no way out, and without the government to, to get you out, and that's yes. a bigger conversation. But um, yes, anyway. wow, awesome, so great to talk to you, Brian. You too, you that's too. Great. I've 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 seen you you know before, and this is our first time meeting. Uh, but but I'm familiar with your work, and and I'm a fan. Uh, so it was a real uh, real treat for you to invite me on. Awesome. I don't know how I came across you, but I'm so glad I did. And I'm going to say again, fellow Midwesterner, love it. We think alike. Yep. yep. It's not just flyover country. We're down here, folks. Yeah. When you're flying yep. over, we're down here, Suzanne yep. and I. Yep. Okay, Brian. So I'm going to definitely call you and have you come back about that um, step parenting thing. I think that's going to be really important. So um, that would be great. I look forward to it. Yeah, great. We'll talk soon then. Okay. okay. Thanks again. Thanks, Brian. Bye. Bye. And that ends this hour of the Suzanne Venker Show. Before you leave us, I'd appreciate it if you'd take one minute to give us a review at Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you use. If you've done that already, or if you can't leave a review on your podcast player for some reason, please consider sharing the show with a friend or a family member. Word of mouth is the primary way we get the word out about the Suzanne Venker Show. Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great week.